Hello, everybody, and welcome to the latest edition of Box Office Pro's live sessions. I'm Daniel Luria, the editorial director of Box Office Pro, the only publication in North America exclusively focused on covering the theatrical exhibition business. Joined here today by my co-host and our deputy editor, Rebecca Polly. Hey, Rebecca, how are you? Uh, it's finally spring in New York. Uh, movie theaters are finally open in New York City, so I'm I'm doing pretty good. <laughs> good start. Good start. Uh, so to everyone joining us today, we will be sharing the results of our box office barometer readers poll. So in the first quarter of this year, we asked our readers uh, currently working at a cinema to vote for their picks of 2020's most important vendors, film and their pick for industry figure of the year. We wanted to make sure this was something led by and voted on exclusively by exhibitors. And uh, it, it was interesting. So at various periods throughout our 101 year history here at Box Office, the barometer has stood as one of our mostly and our most highly anticipated features and one of the indicators for the sentiment among the exhibition industry. We are happy to bring that back. This year, we have representatives from more than 50 circuits that ended up voting in this poll, and we are looking forward to sharing those results with you uh, shortly. And uh, as you can see on the slide here, uh, thanks, you, uh, thanks to our sponsor, GTC, whom we will be hearing more from later in this presentation. Uh, but first, after sharing the results of the barometer poll, we will be hosting a live panel discussion on the only category in this year's barometer that was decided on by the box office editorial team. Namely, that is the 2020 cinema trend of the year, should come as a surprise to no one, private cinema rentals. Uh, we would like to thank our sponsor, GDC Technology, for their support of this webinar. Uh, they will be prefacing the panel conversation with a brief presentation on how they've been working on an innovative model for the future of private rentals in an effort to make this pandemic lifeline an ongoing revenue source for cinemas worldwide. Then following GDC's presentation, our panel conversation will feature Annalise Holyoke from Cinepolis USA, Rob Lehman of Santikos, Chris Tickner from B&B Theaters, Clint Wieslowski from Marcus Theaters, and Tony Adamson from GDC Technology. As always, you can submit questions for our panelists using the chat tab on the right side of the screen. And please don't forget to register for our next live session webinar taking place next week on April 21st. Uh, there we'll be hosting a question and answer conversation with the organizers of Cinema Week. Uh, and if you want to find out more about what Cinema Week is, please register on the link that will be appearing shortly on your screen. Uh, so Daniel, let's take it to you. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, yeah, it, it was an interesting year to say the least, uh, a difficult year for a lot of us. So it should be of no surprise that our first uh, category in this box office barometer was the film of the year. Uh, again, no surprise here. We had an overwhelming number of votes for Christopher Nolan's Tenet being voted as the most important film for theatrical exhibition in 2020. Can't say I'm surprised there, Rebecca. And I think that leads us into the next couple of awards that we have, uh, Rebecca. So uh, following up on the award for Tenet, exhibitors also voted on the most important theatrical distributor and exhibitor relations department of 2020, naming Warner Brothers as this year's recipient for both of those awards. Um, it's an interesting result, certainly, as Warner Brothers uh, took the bold and controversial step of releasing their entire 2021 slate, day and date, on HBO Max, along with uh, in theaters. Doing so, however, we saw that uh, Warner Brothers was really one of the only studios to consistently stick to release dates and bring films to theaters during a critical time. Uh, the majority of our voters really responded to that, responded to still being able to play films like, well, Godzilla vs. Kong was 2021 and not 2020, but you get the idea. So uh, congratulations to Warner Brothers for this honor. And on the vendor side, our readers in exhibition voted for the Vista Group as the cinema vendor of the year. And to accept that award, we have right now a short video acknowledgement 
from uh, Vista Group CEO, Kimball Riley uh, for the exhibition community. So let's get that going here. Good morning from Auckland, New Zealand. I'm recording this to thank you, our friends in exhibition, for your acknowledgement of our contribution to the industry's success. On behalf of the whole Vista Group, from London to Cape Town, from Los Angeles to Mexico City, from Amsterdam and Groningen to Auckland, we thank you and we are delighted to receive this award. We work really, really hard at being close to our customers and in this last year which has been tremendously difficult for us all we've redoubled our efforts to be there to support you to work with you to continue to innovate because we believe in the success of the theatrical experience going forward and so we we look at the future with a really positive mindset we're confident that the theatrical experience will rebound and that cinema goers will return in droves and we'll be there to support our customers so again thank you and at some point in the future i'm not sure when I look forward to being able to meet in person and convey my thanks to you all. Thank you. And thanks again to Kimball Riley from the Vista Group. And let me, there we go. It's uh, having a bit of a tech issue here, Daniel. Apologies. Uh, no worries. <laughs> let's let's move on. Let's move on for the next uh, for the next. Yeah. Uh, for the next award here, we have for the concessions and F and B vendor of the year category. Our readers actually voted for Vistar, uh, not Vista, although you guys got the the regular uh, <laughs> category on vendors. So Vistar was voted as the 2020 recipient for this year's box office mm -hmm. uh, concessions and F and B vendor of the year. Congratulations to them, and that leads us to the next category here for Cinema Technology Vendor of the Year. That is where our partners at Cineonic ended up coming out as the winners of this award. And accepting that award for Cineonic is a video message from Cineonic CEO, Vim Bayans. Let me cue up this video and thanks again for our partners at mm. Cineonic to, to help us for in, in this part of, uh, of the cinema recovery. There we go. So, and, and of course, everyone's used to the, the, the webinar tech glitches by now, but uh, we do have the lovely slides also for Vistar and Cineonic. And here, for no, without further ado, uh, Vim Bayans for Cineonic accepting this award. Congratulations to Box Office Pro for a great initiatives, but specifically for the readers and viewers and listeners which have taken the time to give the opinion about companies and people within this industry. Sinyonic is very committed to the exhibition industry. Recovery is coming soon. We do believe together we can build a great future. We do know that COVID has shaken around us and the whole world with that. But we think that co-creation, collaboration and partnerships are our way to strengthen this community. But the most important thing is we continuously want to remind people why they should see movies on the big screen because of the great experience. Thank you very much. And then I think we're having the, let me pull this up. Sorry guys for the, it's always something uh, in, in 2021. <sighs> there we are. All and right. Do you see it? Cause I don't see it. <laughs> no, but let's, let's keep on going. Let's keep the show <laughs> on the road since we this. have a lot of things uh, here on our plate. Um, so Rebecca, the last category here at the box office barometer was industry figure of the year. Could you tell us who ended up getting the most votes from that category? So no surprise there. Uh, representatives from more than 50 cinema circuits recognized the entire team over at the National Association of Theater Owners. It, it was an overwhelming, uh, overwhelming victory and well-deserved. The entire NATO team over the course of 2020 has done his work tirelessly to establish cinema safe protocols, to continue to build a base of communications between theaters, and crucially to secure government funding for cinemas in need. On behalf of our readers and the entire team at Box Office Pro, we extend our congratulations and our deepest thanks to our colleagues at NATO. 
uh, congratulations to all the winners and please do keep an eye out this December when we release the poll for next year's edition of the box office barometer. Thank you, Rebecca. And now moving on to our uh, feature presentation here at Box Office Live Sessions. We are going to be prefacing our panel discussion about the cinema trend of the year, private cinema rentals, where they're going in the future with a brief presentation by our sponsor, GDC Technology, through their SVP of Strategic Planning, planning uh, Tony Adamson. Uh, before we get Tony on stage, we wanted to share a brief video of what Tony will be speaking about. This is a presentation on the GDC GoGo -Go Cinema con concept. So please enjoy this video and we will bring Tony on stage. And that is uh, quite an introduction. Uh, Tony, welcome uh, welcome here for this edition of the Box Office Live Sessions. Going over private rentals, uh, I know you've got a lot to say here around this concept of uh, Go Go Cinema. Let's, uh, let's speak a little bit about it. Could you introduce the concept for us? Tony, can you hear us? Yes, thank you. Yeah, I can. I lost uh, connection there for a second, but I think I have it back now here. Um, yes, thank you, Daniel and Rebecca, and welcome, everyone. Uh, GDC is honored to participate in today's webinar. We're delighted to see private cinema rentals, mini cinemas, and cinema on demand be such hot topics in the industry. As At GDC, we have been advocating these concepts for several years, but, but first, I'd like to thank you and Box Office for hosting today's uh, webinar. I'm, I'm delighted to share the coming virtual roundtable discussion with such distinguished uh, industry leaders. More importantly, I'm excited to see moviegoers finally returning to theaters to see movies the way they were meant to be seen on the big screen. As mentioned, GDC has been a strong promoter of private screenings, mini theaters, and cinema on demand since 2017. We recognize the many positive possibilities to generate revenue these concepts can offer the industry but also recognize there were technical challenges to solve, such as automating processes. At the same time, we recognize the habits of consumers were rapidly changing, more specifically Gen Z and millennial moviegoers who seek immediate gratification and conveniences they expect in this digital world. Our answer was the introduction and launch of Cinema Automation CA 2.0 and GoGo -Go Cinema. For the attendees online today that are asking, so what is GoGo -Go Cinema? Let's take a quick look at the platform called by the Hollywood Reporter as the Netflix of cinema. Uh, let me go back here. So we like to call GoGo -Go Cinema the Uberization of cinema, and it's powered by GDC technology. So as I mentioned, you know, consumers are rapidly changing. You know, today we're in kind of a user value era where they're looking for choice, they're looking for convenience, customization, and they're looking for a better uh, consumer experience. Consumers expect companies to come up with new ideas and bring new ideas uh, to the table. So in, in today's world, uh, theaters are engaging with consumers in, in many ways. Uh, three of them are one through crowdsourcing, but it doesn't seem to be scalable. Uh, loyalty programs, subscription models uh, that may be unsustainable, we'll see, uh, and live events, which uh, in many cases are not automated. 
So, you know, consumers, uh, they feel like they need to be in control from the start to the end and way beyond. So what do we need in the cinema industry today? Whoop. Well, obviously we need to get more guests. We need to lengthen the run of engagements. We need to increase occupancy. And of course we need to better target consumers. So how do we bring more efficiency to the entertainment world? Well, at GDC, we see that happening through automation, through cloud computing, and through the digital platform, Google Cinema, all leading to choice, convenience, customization, and a better customer experience. So Google Cinema, first of all, it's a consumer facing platform. It's one that the consumer takes control of what they want to see, when they want to see it, and where they want to see it. So now for the first time, a consumer gets to select the movies that they want to see and when they want to see it and where they want to see it. So there's three ways that you can uh, book a movie on the platform, but you can schedule screenings of current releases. You can schedule crowdsource screenings of current releases, and you can crowdsource screenings of legacy library title. And as I mentioned, there's three ways. So I can buy a ticket and I can crowdsource with my friends and I need to meet a minimum. So let's say 15 tickets. Once I get to that minimum, it's a confirmed booking. Now, I haven't seen The Godfather in a long time, so I want to confirm it. So I just go ahead and buy all 15 tickets and take and get a hold of my friends and say, hey, uh, you know, I booked The Godfather at eight o'clock at this X theater. So join me. The third way of doing it on the platform is I really want to be in a private uh, cinema. I want to be by myself with my friends and I don't want to open it up. In the first two where I book a ticket or I buy all the tickets to meet the minimum, that opens up to, uh, to uh, normal audiences. It, it becomes a scheduled screening. So I just want my friends or my family to watch the movie with me so we can, you know, we can talk, we can text, we can do whatever we want. Uh, I, so on the platform, I can also book uh, a private screening. So now for the first time, I can initiate the screening. You can initiate the screening of your choice. So how does this all accomplished? Well, how do we integrate Google Cinema with your theaters? Well, first of all, we integrate with the point of sale. Then we integrate with our cinema automation, CA 2.0, which includes and features a very large storage capacity listen to this you can actually store up to 2000 movies all of which can be live streamed to up to 30 screens within the complex all leading to cons to choice convenience customization and a better customer experience which leads to a more sustainable ecosystem now theaters can operate across a much broader range of product you can offer a much broader range of product you can generate value across the film's entire life cycle. You don't necessarily have to take it off screen just because, you know, it doesn't seem to be, you know, an audience. But, you know, as an example, uh, you know, maybe a movie is left and you didn't get a chance to see it. If it's on the Google Cinema platform, you can book it. And the entire system is automated from the consumer side to the theater side. There's an entire back end uh, where you see what's going on and, and can keep track of everything. And now you have the ability to support scheduled as well as crowdsourced showtimes, both with current and library titles. So we launched Gogo Cinema in Asia in 2019, in Singapore in October, in Malaysia in November. Well, we all know what happened in 2020, but coming soon to US theaters is Gogo Cinema. Gogo Cinema powered by GDC technology be on the lookout. It's coming soon. Thanks, Tony. And uh, it looks like perfect timing for, for a solution like this as we start to think about what the future of private rentals are going to look like, right? And as part of this, we might be in a situation as we wait for more studio content to come in and some dates are changing where 
a lot of multiplexes, some of your theaters, they may have screens that are available, right? That, that may be, maybe you won't need to program a, a film in, in each case. So I know that is bringing in GoGo -Go Cinema as a concept overseas, specifically, specifically in the Asia Pacific region, you've looked at installing mini theaters as a possibility to uh, engage some of these cinema goers and mini theaters as a potential solution to bring in and extend the life cycle of private rentals. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Oh, yes, that's actually, um, it's a topic very near and dear to the company's heart. Uh, as you said, mini theaters are very popular in uh, Asia, Australia, Europe, uh, and the trend is starting to come here. It's definitely uh, an, an up and coming trend. Uh, and I'd, I'd like to take a minute just to read this. Um, uh, Mary McNamara is a film critic from the Los Angeles Times. So television, videotape, blockbuster, home theaters, on demand, Netflix, the Cineplex has been under siege from modern upstarts for decades. But it's impossible to imagine a world without the big screen, if only because going to the movies has always been as much about the ritual of going to as it is about the movies. I think that's well said by Mary. We know we all enjoy going to the movies and we should all see the content on the big screen. But let's take a look at the evolution of the movie theater and just a real simple overview. You know, early 20th century was the Grand Movie Palace. In 1963, the multiplex era began with a twin and leading up to, to you know, 14, 16, 18 plexes. Then in 1995, the Megaplex era began with the 24, 30 screen complexes. And now many would say we're kind of in the dine-in era or the entertainment center era. So what's next in the evolution of the movie theater? Well, we feel very strongly that it's the mini theater the mini theater we see as the future. So one of the things that kind of driven us to this um, conclusion is, is through a lot of research that we've done and a lot of conversations we've had with uh, exhibitors that have mini theaters. But uh, I also found this to be very interesting because we've kind of studied the, the habits of uh, the, the Gen X, Gen Z and the millennials. Uh, and uh, one of the in back in um, 2018, I found this quote from uh, Helen Lude, a main takeaway was what gets teenagers to the movie theaters. Being able to see a movie before it's available at home with friends in a cool location. So that kind of says it all, you know, they want to kind of be with their friends. They want to be with their families. They want to text. They want to talk. They want to do this. They want to do that. And, and in the mini theater in a private you know, setting, uh, they do that. So what is the delay uh, in this trend in the US? Well, obviously competition from home entertainment, uh, resistance to change. Uh, we're in the dine-in era and, and we're not gonna change. So many exhibitors uh, are resistant and but they're just as equal in amount that are ready to move on to the next era. Recently built suburban complexes, they average seven screens with about 125 to 250 seats. Uh, there's several other barriers, high capital investment, uh, film distribution costs. But most of all, we found one of the biggest barriers to entering this mini theater world is the projection equipment is not designed for mini or micro spaces. And of course, there's kind of this going on right now is some significant consolidation. The giants of exhibition now control over half the screens. We all know the life cycle stage of the industry is mature. And oh, by the way, 2020, 2020, and 2020, kind of a big barrier. So what is driving the trend? Well, store closings, the abundance of retail space where you can uh, build a mini theater at a very low cost, uh, very lower, much lower capital investment. It only requires a thousand square feet and a 15 foot ceiling if you just wanna build one, uh, but you could build 10 or 20. Uh, there's uh, actually complexes in Asia that have up to 20 of these uh, mini theaters. Uh, it allows the cinema operator uh, strategies to increase your revenue. There's a lot of ways to use the mini theater. Uh, the first fine taste among Gen Z and millennial moviegoers is driving this trend. 
Cinema on demand, as I just mentioned, go-go cinema. Uh, cinema on demand is, is going to be driving these trends. And, you know, consumers are changing from buying tickets to, as we'll talk about a little bit later, to renting theaters. But you know what, don't give up on that 50 plus crowd. You know, I, I fall in that category. Uh, we make up 27% of all moviegoers and 25% of all frequent moviegoers. Uh, we see on average 6.8 movies, which is 5% more than the millennials. And we're significantly more likely to watch art house films, dramas, and, and, and indie films. So don't give up on us. But, but as I mentioned, you know, the trend is growing internationally you know, like gangbusters in China, Thailand, Japan, UK, Australia, but the US um, is coming soon. So with the mini theater and, and combined with the cinema on demand platforms, uh, you know, traditional formats like TV still play an important role in discovery. But when we take a look at moviegoers ages 18 to 24, online takes the top spot. Uh, other research we've, we've found is that 78% of them discover movies online through desktop or mobile, and 63% on mobile specifically. This shift towards online platforms is something marketers really need to prepare for. And we feel we've prepared for it with the GoGo Cinema. It's a seamless mobile experience from discovery to the purchase. So in conclusion, you know, many theaters, AKA many cinemas, micro cinemas, whatever you want to call it, it's a growing trend internationally, specifically in Asia and Europe. It's just a matter of time before the trend takes off in the US, Canada, and Latin America. The main drivers are strategies to increase revenue with alternative programming, including social activities such as karaoke, simulated golf, and much, much more. Changing movie going habits, especially with Gen Z and millennials, but as I mentioned, don't forget that 50 plus movie lover crowd, they're all gonna be driving this concept. And last but not least, consumers want choice. They want convenience and they want it now, which can be offered with the mini, city, mini theater concept. Uh, thank you, Daniel. Hey, no, thank you, so, Tony, so much for uh, coming in and, and sharing these insights with us. We are going to now discuss about this future of private rentals with some of the industry's, uh, I think, uh, foremost experts in applying these concepts. Before I get them on stage and as we get everything ready, please enjoy this uh, sponsor message for GDC as we bring our panel on stage. Thanks. I am Espedio Supra a Red Dot award-winning and major Hollywood Studios approved DCI compliant cinema laser projector. Perfect for boothless mini theaters. Designed for quick and easy installation without a hush box or an exhaust fan. I am a work of art. I received the prestigious 2020 Red Dot award based on my sophisticated technical features. The jury of Red Dot award said I open up areas where professional projection had not been possible before. I am uniquely compact. My small form factor is achieved with GDC's multifunctional all-in-one board, which integrates the DCI compliant media server, integrated cinema processor, ICP, and DMD formatter board. I am lightweight, yet packed with high-tech features. I am quiet so quiet that you can even install me right in the middle of an auditorium without anyone noticing me. I am cost efficient, possibly the lowest total cost of ownership for a Hollywood Studios DCI approved laser projector. Simply hang me inside the auditorium without any exhaust fan and hush box. Easy to maintain and operate. Easy to maintain and operate. Option to customize my magnetic cover to match your ceiling decor or add your company logo. I am an RGB plus laser phosphor projector featuring the world's leading ALPD 4.0 technology. My light engine and lens are designed with IP5X level of dust proof protection with a laser lifetime up to 30,000 hours of operation. I project a bright image of up to six meters wide on commercial cinema screens and 270 inch diagonal for home theaters, yachts, conference rooms and more. I support 3D playback with more than 30% light efficiency, nearly twice the brightness of many existing 3D projection systems. I am powerful. 
I'm packed with power by GDC all-in-one board and diskless Cinecache memory. Content ingest and playback can be performed concurrently without local hard drive storage. The fastest ingest of new content during playback. Supporting cinema on-demand application with GDC's Cinema Automation 2.0 that enables the storage and playback of thousands of movies. Built-in digital cinema audio processor will be available as an option. You no longer need an external cinema audio processor to playback movie titles in uncompressed audio tracks, reproducing the most accurate sound possible. I am smart. Supra Command Center Intuitive Web-Based Control UI is accessible via the built-in Wi-Fi with a desktop, a laptop, or a tablet. I am Espedio Supra, ideal for mini theaters and non-traditional exhibition options in hotels, screening rooms, and yachts. I am the best possible projection system from renowned technologists, GDC, Apotronics, and Texas Instruments. And thanks again to GDC for that preface conversation, really setting the stage for what I think is going to be a fascinating fascinating conversation with our panel here. Welcome to everyone. Uh, I guess let's start up the top. Rob Lehman, the COO of Centicos. You guys were among the first circuits in the United States to reopen back in May. And uh, as I understand it, you now have uh, your full financial results of that first quarter in 2021, where private rentals really helped your business. Rob, can you go into detail on what that experience was like for you? What were some of the uh, insights you found from the private rentals business in the first quarter? Well, thanks for uh, inviting me to this uh, panel discussion. Um, you know, back in, uh, November, we started uh, getting a lot of requests from our customers about private screenings and, you know, uh, everybody in the industry started looking at it about the same time. Um, the uh, our, our friends at uh, Cinemark and Draft House and AMC jumped on it first. Um, we followed suit very quickly in December and uh, we started uh, in December. We had uh, 658 private screening rentals that month. We had 54 on Christmas day alone. And uh, I'd say 50 of the 54 were for Wonder Woman. So it really took off there. Uh, we had a Christmas classic. So we played Elf, uh, National William Boone's Vacation. And it, it like I said, we, we did three different price structures. We did a $75 rental, we did a 135 rental, and then uh, Wonder Woman, we did 175. And we were uh, blown away by the number of uh, people that uh, wanted private rentals. You know, we had 194 alone for Wonder Woman, and that was for the month of December. So in six days, uh, 194 private showings. So, um, you know, we, we've adapted over the last three, four months. Uh, January, uh, we, we dropped, we had it at seven theaters. We dropped down to our four uh, four theaters, our big ones, uh, basically twice a day, um, every day, at, or I'm sorry, two auditoriums every day. Uh, and, you know, we did another 316 there. And, you know, a lot of the Christmas movies were already gone by then. And, you know, February, we, we just, we kept moving and changing the way we were doing adapting like everybody does um, for the last year. Uh, crisis management, we've all done very well with that. And, uh, you know, so right now, you know, uh, in February, we introduced it to hook up your PlayStation 4, 5, Xbox. And last month in March, we had, you know, we had 43 private rentals uh, on just wow. that alone. So, um, and that's just know, gaming, correct, Rob? That's just that's bring, just bring in your own content, no licensing there. You bring in everything. And there's, a, there's been a demand for that. It's been a huge demand. The kids just love it. We did a great marketing, uh, uh, internal marketing from our uh, video team here and we we played that in front of the uh uh in front of the movies uh that we were showing and once we started showing that uh you know we got a spike on the uh, xboxes and uh playstations and having uh you know 15 kids in an auditorium playing madden or uh call of duty uh it, it's it's quite intense 
and uh, so intense that some of the parents have to leave because the kids are uh, pretty loud and uh, start, start cussing a little bit. So the parents are out at the bar probably enjoying a beer or two. Um, but yeah, we've, uh, you know what, I, I believe, you know, that these private showings are here to stay. I don't think they're going to go away. You know, we, we already are putting them in our smallest auditorium. So, you know, we got a couple auditoriums that are 36 seats and it just makes sense. So it's up right. to 20 people. Um, right now, but we're looking at different price structures too. Uh, you know, we don't do the 175 anymore, but um, I just got informed uh, about 10 minutes before we, we jumped on here that Demon Slayer that comes out in a couple of weeks, we've already had five private rentals on that one and we jumped that price to $200. Wow. And, uh, so uh, like I said, I think they're here to stay. Some of those small auditoriums aren't going to, you know, um, they're not going to go away of course, but I think uh, having a capacity four times a day into those auditoriums makes a lot of financial sense for us. And we're talking about with Demon Slayer, of course, the number one film of all time in Japan released during the pandemic, which is an, an, an incredible uh, data point, I think. And we're seeing a film that maybe wouldn't have had a wide release in the United States, this concept of private rentals bringing in new business and auditoriums, as you mentioned, Rob, Texas, a little bit different with the capacity restric restrictions there, but in other parts of the country at 25, 50% capacity, a 36 person auditorium, not sure how much money that can bring, but uh, no, thank you for, for those insights. Uh, really good news. I think for, for seeing niche titles uh, break away through the private rental uh, concept. I want to build on that with Annalise over at uh, Sinopolis USA. Annalise, uh, you guys are also uh, have a big presence in Texas, and you were actually one of the first people I spoke to about private rentals last summer when you guys were launching this. Uh, something that Rob said that I found fascinating was getting that word out uh, to viewers, getting that word out to the audience in marketing that. Uh, looking at it from a marketing angle, What's been the challenge in sustaining business off the private rentals concept for almost a year as Sinopolis has already done? Let me get you off mute real fast, Annalise. Uh, and make sure, there we go, go ahead. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, so we actually launched private rentals in May of last year at our movie house and eatery brand. Um, right before the pandemic, that brand was going to transition to Sinopolis, but of course, you know, many things happened that um, didn't allow us to do that, but we launched the private rentals before we even opened to the public. So that was sort of our marketing angle when we first did that. And um, we were only open for private events and it was a family affair. We had, you know, the CEO running drinks and all sorts of stuff people volunteering to come in because in May, of course, it was still um, dicey on, you know, safety precautions and stuff, but the demand was there in Texas and um, it really took off from there. And it was a great way for us to open when, you know, as our concept is, you know, obviously very food focused, restaurant driven, bringing back employees, reordering food, all of that was, um, very difficult to gauge when we'd be able to do that. And by having like a limited menu and just opening it up to those reservations made it really easy for us to get started. Um, I would say the biggest um, hurdle of marketing it thus far for a year is that the demand is really there, but for us, we're starting to shift into a position where it doesn't really make as much sense for us to have as many options. Um, you know, I'll hand it to Cinemark. They got it online really fast. That was something that I think they did a really great job of. Our, I, you know, for us, we were doing it bare bones. Like we were not spending money to develop the website. Most of our team was on furlough. Um, and so we were just kind of trying to do the best we could. And now that we have it online, it's been great. Um, I don't think the concept is going away anytime soon, but for us, it's really shifted, you know, away from those primetime hours. Prior to COVID, you know, our company was doing thousands of private events every year and primarily corporate, but I think we always all joked that one of the most, you know, the most time consuming events were those like kids' birthday parties that were really not spending any money. <laughs> and our, you know, highly paid sales team was 
focusing way too much attention on that. And I think this has been a game changer for us now that we've gotten it online, you know, to still have that Saturday morning, 11 a.m. spot that if you want to have your kid's birthday party, you can book it online yourself. And quite frankly, we're just not going to help you, <laughs> you know, coordinate clowns and all these other things that they want to do. If you want to go that route, you'll have to, you know, go have a higher food beverage minimum and book with our team. But in general, the, the hardest part for us now is that with capacity going up to 50% in California, it doesn't really make sense for us to continue offering those prime time slots, but the demand is there and people are kind of frustrated that they can't get, you know, a theater for four people or even 20 people when now that capacity is up to 50%, it really makes more sense for us to just have it as a regular show. And that's going to be, a, I think, a key question for the entire industry. How do we turn a lifeline during the pandemic into a consistent source of revenue? But uh, thanks for those insights, uh, Annalise. It's always interesting to, to hear from you. And uh, I want to bring in uh, Clint Wisielowski over at uh, Marcus. Clint, actually, some background. When I first started covering this industry in 2013, Clint uh, has been the one person that I've learned the most on in private cinema rentals. It's been a, an area of expertise for Clint and his team at Marcus Theatres. And of course, I guess we're all learning new things at, at every point in time. Clint, you've had years of experience in this concept. What did you learn in 2020 when it became uh, a part of your business to a core part of the Marcus Theatre business? Yeah, I, you know, I think I learned that it, the the shift was dramatic to the point where my department doesn't really exist even to this day as what it was in 2013, right? We had group sales at that time. Mm -hmm. You know, we had event cinema. Um, you know, first of all, thank you for inviting me. And this panel is phenomenal. They, you know, the insights that they provided are so right on point that they've stolen a lot of my thunder. So I blame them. But, um, you know, we we were a full screen buyout and we were an F&B minimum. We were an admin fee. We were, uh, you know, a, a, a revenue stream that was ancillary. And that's what we even call it on our P&L to the actual movie going experience of, of you know, tickets and box office and, and F&B. Um, you know, a couple of interesting numbers, right? Prior to this pandemic, an average event at Marcus Theaters was about $850. And now, that's dramatically different. It's not even a, it's not even event cinema or group sales. It's a Marcus private cinema. So, uh, you know, the volume is tremendous. And, and I went back and I ran some numbers where we were, we're right now booking about 40% more events than we had in 2019 over these first, this first quarter. Right. So the, the volume is tremendous. The revenue and the attendance doesn't even compare. So even at that volume, it's still, uh, you know, not significant enough for us to say that this would be our business model going forth. I think Annalise called it 100% correct that uh, it was, it's been great during this period. And, you know, what Rob said, and, and even what GDC was talking about with these mini cinemas, look, the pandemic created those, right? I mean, we took a 50 seat auditorium and we immediately dropped it down to 25 after it had been a hundred prior to recliners, right? I mean, it is just such a dramatic change in what our buildings and our structures even look like that a mini cinema just kind of came out of this mm -hmm. and this ability to rent them. We've always had group sales. Like you said, I started this in 2013 with Marcus and, and now it, it bringing it online. And I, again, I, I think Emily said it perfectly when she said Cinemark jumped early and did a phenomenal job bringing it online made a huge difference for us. Rob mentioned what happened to them in December we mirror that almost exact with our December skyrocket. We, we've had group sales since we, since we launched, since the pandemic hit. It existed. You could always reach out to my people, but the calls went to zero. Um, now we're, we're closing in between self-service and full service. So that's what we call it today in, in Marcusville. Uh, we're nearing in on 25,000 events over the course of this launch since December. So it's been integral. I, you know, it, but it is evolving. It's changing. It's not going to be the same coming out of this. Again, I go back to Annalise and what she said. It just doesn't make sense when you when you're starting to fill your buildings. And I, I Daniel, you and I talked about this earlier. 
I call it the 100 100 phase, right? Mm -hmm. When you get to 100% open and 100% occupied, this system no longer works. Um, Marcus has some triggers there. We limit it based on the seating of the of the theater on COVID seating of the theater, and then we have a we have a uh, a system in our in our sales portal that if a single guest buys an individual ticket, that show no longer becomes available for Marcus Private Cinema. So it's one or the other. It's kind of a race, right? The, okay. the tickets go on sale. If someone buys it out then it's no longer available for general admission. But if a single general admission ticket is sold, it converts from Marcus Private Cinema to the general public. And that's worked for us. When I look, I ran a couple of numbers today. Right now, our system, on average, the person is buying their Marcus Private Cinema 10 days in advance. It was as high as 12 just a few months ago, but now it's dropped to 10 days in advance. But still, that's a significant amount of time on what for a general admission ticket is sometimes the very day of, or hey, let's go to the movies tonight. And that's something that our colleague, I'm sorry, I think that might be your microphone, uh, Clint, if you can uh, mute briefly here. Um, if that's something that our colleague over at Regal, uh, Ken Thews, the chief marketing officer at Regal, just asked us about. Uh, where are these private rentals coming from? In my conversation with Clint, uh, one of the interesting things that, that I found out is that once Marcus set up their own dedicated website portal to get reservations and book reservations for private cinema rentals, you guys actually saw uh, an upswing in those numbers in getting the concept back up and running. Clint, can you speak a little bit about that, about how um, the ticketing layer works, the reservation layer works? It's something that I know Tony over at GDC is a big part of GoGo -Go Cinema, making sure that you make it easy on the consumer to book that private rental online the way we've done with online ticketing for years now. Yeah, and it's made all the difference, right? So I, you know, as much as I love my crew and, and our group sales department, once we automated this system and allowed people to come in through our what we're calling our microsite, um, it it dramatically changed the numbers for us. It, it it again allowed us to with with greatly depleted staff based on you know all the furloughs we had to to monetize these private rentals. It it, it really did make a huge difference. We set it up such that the show times appear on both our traditional website. And our, mic and our micro site, we have triggers involved. So we limit it by seat count, COVID seat count in the auditorium and times of day. So it's also controlled in the field. We set up attributes and price cards based on the feature. So we run from 99 for catalog titles through 149 for season first run and 175 for the, the first run titles that come out. All of those are clearly marked on the micro site. When you get to our micro site, you're no longer on our website. You're, you're involved in this, in this little microcosm of your ability to manage it yourself. And again, I'm going to go back to Annalise and say that allowing that guest to make that purchase from beginning to end with no interaction from me, it makes it much faster, much cleaner, and much easier for us to execute. When we first launched, the way that it worked is we had Marcus Private Cinema, which meant that auditorium and that feature were, and that showtime were really your only choice. We've since evolved the program to what we're calling Marcus You Pick, and that allows you to go in and choose a showtime and then layer on the title that you want to watch at that showtime. It, it replicates a little bit more of the Cinemark model where, you know, all the titles that are booked in the auditorium then become available for you at that seven o'clock. What that does is it dramatically increases the inventory available to the guest. When they look at one of our locations and they see a seven o'clock You Pick, it appears under all of the banners for all the titles available. The prices will shift based on that. Now, one of the things that this goes back to is exactly what GDC's presentation was. It requires a manual move of a print. So you've got to move that material over to that house. We cut Marcus you pick off 72 hours in advance, 72 hours before the day of the show. If it's not sold, it converts to a general admission slash NPC opportunity. Um, our, our goal there is not to have empty auditoriums, right? I, and again, as we talk about the business model, I think that's one thing we want to try to avoid as we get to that 100-100. We don't want this thing to start, you know, creating, you know, empty auditoriums in our, in our theaters. But that jump, when I, when I talk to you about the 25,000 that we're closing in on, to tell you how dramatic that's been, when we launched this in December, we're already at over well over 19,000 on the self-serve portal. 
and the other five are coming in through the full serve portal. So uh, it, it really, it, it's dramatic in what that shift has been over to the ability for people to do it on their own. That's very interesting, uh, Clint. Thanks for, for bringing in those insights. I want to bring in uh, uh, Chris Tickner. As we as we look at how to figure out the uh, the financial model, the business model, something like this, a big challenge everyone is facing, Chris, is how do I make sure this doesn't cannibalize those auditoriums, as Clint was saying, right? You don't want to cannibalize an auditorium with the availability of a private rental. Could you share a little bit of B&B Theaters' approach to not only the private cinema rentals, but also in pricing and the price distinctions of private cinema rentals during the pandemic. And a follow-up there, while I have you here, uh, Chris, uh, do you expect that to change? Do you expect the pricing model to change at a certain point so it doesn't cannibalize those earnings? Chris, I think uh, we've got you on mute. Let me uh, let me make sure we, there we go. Um, so I, I think, just like Clint said, now I'm going last. So they've taken all of the great points from, from us. But uh, ju just like, you know, everyone on this panel, you know, we started fairly early on, on the private rental uh, aspects, you know, late May, early June. That, that was basically how we started opening buildings, especially with, uh, with different capacity restrictions in a lot of our locations. That was the only way we felt sort of safe to, to be able to do this and, and, and encourage people back, back in, which turned out to be a really great system for us. Uh, and then it just grew and grew. We, we kept wondering uh, whenever like all of this would end um, as far as like how many people are gonna continue to want to come and rent movies to watch something they can watch at home, which was pretty much what we were able to show. And it stayed fairly consistent, you know, all the way from you know July all the way through through March with with these movies that that uh, everyone can see at home because they they want to go and get that theatrical experience. Now we had basically the same structure, you know, sort of like everyone said here, you know, ninety nine dollars ish for for an older movie. Um, we were actually charging full ticket price for for anything that was new. They had to buy at least twenty five seats. Uh, in the auditorium, which was more than we were probably selling for for most of these, uh, and especially with the reduced capacity going forward. And then in April, so like this month, we've actually moved away from allowing guests to purchase like those older titles on the weekends, just because we don't have the space. Like even even uh, even with having 12, 16, 18 screen auditoriums when you cut down the capacity for us to you know 25 50 percent godzilla making 50 million dollars at the box office we needed that on you know 10 screens and we're going to make a lot more money selling those for 10 screens but we've also been able to shift people to those monday through thursday dates we've been able to shift people to those off-peak show times uh for some of those like retro titles or obviously you know booking for you know all of the new products that are coming out we do expect that to sort of continue on uh, with with uh, May releases to not have as many spots available for those. But we do think that um, people will still be buying for the new titles, even if it's at a higher rate, especially since a lot of our locations do have some smaller auditoriums that we can utilize for that. And we'll continue to grow, Like I think, like Clint said, to getting back to our, you know, 800 Fifteen hundred, two thousand dollar events when we're able to fill up our auditoriums at a hundred percent, but we still have you know eighty percent of our locations at B and B are recliners, so we always have you know a thirty to forty seat auditorium that we've sold thousands of these screenings to that now they know that they can do it. So I think they're going to come back to watch uh, a movie on that thirty five seat theater for us so it might be an ongoing revenue stream they might not get you know avengers on an opening weekend but we'll tell them hey you can get that 30 seat auditorium two weeks after they will be like okay i'll watch it opening weekend and then i'll come back for my private rental two weeks after so 
No, that, those, those are good observations as we start to plan a future for this concept. I think the, the next question is we approach the hour mark that I want to start maybe with you, Chris, since we've got you on screen and then go through the panel, is what is the number one tip or the number one learning lesson that you took from instituting private cinema rentals uh, over the last year that you'll be keeping moving forward? Uh, I mean, I think the number one tip that I have is that that the guests are out there. Uh, you just have to find the right way to to reach them. And whether it's using a program like GoGo Cinema or, or creating your own like like uh, Marcus is doing, anything that can break bring them from wanting to go see a movie to click, click, you're there and you have your own private rental that just takes all that guesswork out it is going to be invaluable if you're wanting to continue to grow this particular option. Thanks. And uh, going down the line, I think, Rob, over at your end at Centicos, uh, a year open almost, we're approaching that anniversary. What's your number one takeaway, your number one lesson learned from the private uh, cinema rental experience? I think the biggest thing is looking at what others are doing. So, you know, Clint had brought it up, Chris. Had, you know, we've all looked at websites, uh, frequently asked questions uh, and worked our way through that. Um, the one I'm going to share with the whole team was, even if uh, a PlayStation comes into your theater, uh, this happened to us last week, opening week of Godzilla. So we, we had an auditorium. These kids come in, 20 kids come in, 10 of them got con shirts on, 10 of them got Team Godzilla shirts on, but they brought their PlayStation. So they walk into the auditorium, they hook up the PlayStation, and we have one of our managers in there, and all of a sudden they're loading up Con versus, uh, or Godzilla versus Con through HBO Max. Oh, surprise. Okay, so, that's different. You know, they, they rented the auditorium for $75 under that one, but we're renting auditoriums for 135 playing through our projectors. So we said, whoa, wait a minute. This isn't gonna work. Give us 60 more dollars. We'll run it through our projectors. So even when you give them the auditorium, you still gotta do the checks on them because they're pretty, that was pretty creative. So <laughs> we had to tweak our FAQs again on that one that you can't stream you know, that way. So it, it's, uh, it's always evolving. That's for sure. So people used to sneak in popcorn. You had to monitor that. Now they're sneaking in prints, actual yes. film prints. Uh, <laughs> thanks to our, our, uh, our good friends at HBO max, uh, I guess building off that, uh, Annalise, what's been uh, your number one learning lesson, uh, that you could share with us, uh, during this, uh, year. I think, like I mentioned, getting it online and making sure that the guests can book as seamlessly as possible. Um, you know, the people that are renting it are the millennials that are very tech savvy and they really don't have any interest in dealing with the sales team. So I think for us, being able to do that was really important. And then also kind of not comparing yourself to everyone else because everyone has a different business model. Some people have 15 screens. We have you know, an average of maybe like eight screens. So, um, you know, just understanding what you want out of it, because it can seem really attractive when you have these groups saying like, oh my gosh, we're, we're booking 20,000 private events. And you know, all these, it sounds so wonderful, but if you know that they're not spending any money, it really isn't that valuable at all. So um, yeah, I, I would just say, you know, trust your gut and, and look at the numbers and make sure that it actually is working for you. And if it is something that you want to do, getting it online really fast. Nice, nice. Now I appreciate those, those insights as well. Uh, a lot of learning lessons here. Um, let's continue on with Clint and then close out with, uh, with Tony on, on that advice for the future after, after learning to live with this business model for a year. Yeah, we, you know, like I said, we experienced tremendous success when we made it easier and more convenient for the guest and they were able to skip the interaction with the group sales department. These are not the same sales, but on the bright side, they're going to come back. I, I think that, you know, what this has proven is that people enjoy the experience. I think it's also proven that they like to be together in their own group. Um, but that's no different. That's not about face masks or social distancing or feeling safe. It's just wanting to be with people that you've that you know, being in a group where you can share a, a familial lap or you can all cry together, or, you know, be scared together. I think that uh, it, what, it's, what it's shown me at least is that um, the, the ability for us to entertain is still here. And one of the things that I've loved most is the fact that when we first launched this and it started small 
it grew not because don't get me wrong we marketed the heck out of it and our marketing team did a phenomenal job but not just because of our marketing team because when you went in with six ten friends you all talked about it and we ended up getting sales from them and it it grew so it proves that there is a desire for people to get back to the movies and i you know i take great comfort in that because this has been a long haul so uh you know hopefully that means a bright thank you thanks clint uh for, for those insights as well you know th that social sharing and, and letting people know where this is, how this is, how they can experience the movies. That's been so important. I guess, Tony, closing out with you, you shared some great uh, insight as to where this concept can go, how it can live beyond the pandemic. Could you share some closing thoughts after hearing the panel, hearing their insights on how you think this can happen, how GDC could, could potentially help some of the cinemas out there considering how to implement uh, this concept moving forward? Well, thank you, Daniel. And um, yeah, as, you know, as a for former exhibitor, I completely understand the challenges that they're uh, dealing with. But, you know, as I mentioned, uh, you know, I talked about the evolution of, of the movie theater. And let me flash forward about three to maybe even five years from now. Uh, I think as we all realize, uh, you know, there's going to, we're going to live with, you know, a movie being shown day and date. And it could be in the future that there's only tent pole movies. So why do I need 18 screens? Why do I need even 10 screens? So kind of what we're seeing, uh, and it's starting to, you know, a lot of talk in, in Asia countries, is a theater with, say, four large screens, and let's say maybe that's 500, 600 seats. In other words, I'm taking care of Godzilla now. I'm taking care of the Marvel movies. I'm taking care of the DC comic movies. But behind my four or five or six, maybe, you know, at the most, I'm saying four, is 20 little theaters. And these theaters, you don't buy a ticket. You rent the theater by the hour or the, you know, with a minimum of, of so many hours. And you do what you want in this theater. You want to watch a movie? Watch a movie. You want to do karaoke, do karaoke. You want to have a business meeting, have a business meeting. But we see a lot of change happening over the years where there's a lot, you know, less content uh, available or it's only available uh, on online or on a, a, a video demand type of platform. Well, I want to see that movie. I don't want to watch it at home. I'm not someone that watches movies at home. I never have. I never will. So I want to go to one of these newer complexes. I want to pick that movie. I want to watch it with my friends. I want to enjoy myself. I want to do what I want to do. Like I said, if I want to text, I want to talk. Clint mentioned it. I want to have fun with my friends. So I think the industry is, is at a crossroads right now where they have to really look at, you know, the designs. They have to look at, uh, you know, five years from now, am I still going to be building seven plexes, eight plexes with you know, 2,300 seats? Or am I going to be building a complex with 10 to 20 little theaters? I can continue these programs. And I said, you know, people will gravitate, and they already are. We're seeing it right now. People are willing to, to rent the entire theater. They always have. Uh, when I was at AMC, it was also a very big program, uh, you know, the group rental, the group sales program. So, you know, in, in closing, I think, you know, we see these programs carrying on as a technology company. We see it challenges and we look at these challenges through technology. How do we solve the issue uh, as we've done with the Supra 5000 projector. Now you've got a projector you can put in this little theater. How do you solve the booking, the con let the consumer? That's go, go cinema. You know, we look at things a little differently, but at the same time, we follow these trends so that when, you know, this distinguished audience, you know, is looking down the road themselves and seeing, you know, what they're dealing with, you know, they know that the technology exists to do it because in many cases it doesn't. So. I think it's exciting times right now. Um, you know, even though the pandemic kind of pushed this, uh, both the mini theater and the and the consumer cinema on demand platforms, they pushed them a little bit, probably uh, pushed them very quickly. And um, but you know, we see a lot a lot of change happening. 
Um, and I'm, I'm excited. I, I can never be more excited about this industry right now as, as I see this as this evolving change, you know, coming to our industry. So it, it, it's it, it's something that uh, we should all embrace. Uh, and let's all go to the movies. <laughs> It's a great, uh, that's a great closing note, Tony. Thank you so much. And thank you for uh, all our panelists, uh, obviously all our viewers that, that came here today, all the people that voted on the box office barometer uh, sessions for, for this year. We're excited to bring this back next year. Hopefully uh, nothing against private cinema rentals. I'm really looking forward for them to be part of this industry moving forward. But again, as we know, as part of the recovery is getting back to normal getting back to uh, to regular showings and, and show times. So once again, on behalf of Box Office Pro, our entire team here, thank you to our panelists. Thank you to all the winners that came in and participated in today's session. And we look forward to uh, having you back here next week to learn more about the Cinema Week initiative that is going to be coming to theaters this summer. Don't forget to register. You can find that uh, registration page on our website, boxofficepro.com under the live sessions tab on the top left corner. Thank you again and have a great afternoon.